Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our conversation on monetary policy in a globalized world. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Ryan Avent. I'm economics columnist at The Economist. Uh, joining me today, uh, and I'm very, very glad to have him here, is Olivier Blanchard, who is senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Um, before that was uh, economic counselor and head of research at the IMF. He's also a professor emeritus at MIT. Uh, the title of the panel has actually been tweaked a bit in light of recent global events. Uh, it was going to be about monetary policy spillovers. I think today we're actually going to talk about um, you know, Trump-related spillovers and look forward a bit at what the source of the next recession um, might be and, um, and sort of what might, what might set it off and when it might occur. And uh, I guess the place to start might be to, to note that a week ago, if we were going to have this conversation, uh, we'd be worried about, a, I think, a, a different set of concerns. At that time, we were looking at a world that seemed to be stuck in a low interest rate, low inflation environment, uh, with uh, sort of chronically weak demand growth, um, it seems like things may be a little bit different in uh, a world in which Trump has been elected president. And perhaps that's reflected in, in global markets where bond prices uh, have been moving uh, quite a lot in recent days. What, what do you see um, bond prices signaling uh, over the last few days? What, what are they telling us? Why are you restricting me to bond prices? No, no, no. The, this, let's hold the whole gamut. Commodity prices, equities, uh, currencies. I think the markets have concluded uh, that uh, from their point of view, things were going to be better for a while because they are short-termists in general. I'm not sure that they are looking very far, but they have concluded the next few years are probably okay. And that comes from, uh, I think, the, the assumption that there will be a fiscal expansion, which uh, other things equal will increase growth. Uh, and uh, it comes from the fact that they hear about financial deregulation, which has to please them. They hear about uh, lower corporate income tax, that has to please them. They hear about uh, lower income taxes on the rich, that also has to please them. So I think they are putting, that's what they are focusing on. Uh, should they only focus on this? Probably not. I mean, we know that you know, there's the fiscal side and then there is the trade side. We can come back to money later. The, uh, and on the trade side, one can think of bad scenarios, I mean, basically where an unintended uh, uh, trade war starts and that could go the other way. So my sense is they probably have it right for the expected value line or the baseline. I think we're likely to have a bit more growth and a bit more inflation and a bit high interest rates over the next few years. Uh, but that comes with a standard deviation, which is very substantial, which could change the sign. Uh, and I'm not sure that that has been uh, priced in. We'll talk about the, the trade side of things in, in just a minute. But let's, let's start with the, uh, the idea that there may be a big fiscal impulse coming uh, in the form of reduced tax rates and, and perhaps spending on infrastructure and other things. Now. The American economy seems to be operating closer to potential than it had been uh, in the recent past. Unemployment is quite low. Uh, can we really expect much uh, in terms of additional growth from uh, of something fiscally stimulative now? Or will it mostly mean much higher inflation? And, and what might that mean for the path of uh, interest rates? Some people have a notion that the supply side is L-shaped. You, know, you go to potential output, and then you can increase it. The reality is you can go much above you get inflation pressure, but you don't get a whole lot of inflation pressure these days from going above. And the so-called Phillips curve trade-off is, is flat. And unless expectations of inflation start going up, which is a big if, uh, or a, a, big, a, a big issue, uh, you basically can run the economy above potential for a while without dramatic inflation uh, implications. Now there's a question, so you can whether you should or not, uh, I think there are two issues. There is the issue of public, public infrastructure spending, and I think there is a case there for doing this in the, even in the context uh, of a full employment economy. Uh, ideally, if this was the only consideration, you might want to reduce other spending, but 
I think that that is justified because the marginal product of public capital at this stage is very high. Uh, is there an argument for more for the rest, for just having a, a larger fiscal deficit? And that goes back to, uh, to the issue that I worked on and others worked on, including Larry Summers, called hysteresis, which is once you've had this very long period of uh, high unemployment, there is a number of resources uh, which are not being used anymore. Uh, you have people who have dropped out and so on, and the labor force participation has decreased more than we thought it should. So there is a sense in which maybe by running the economy above uh, potential for a while, overheating for a while, you actually do good things, even for the long run. We don't know very precisely how much room there is, but that leaves me to be open to going a bit above potential output and not worrying too much. That there may be some supply response, more people coming back into the response. labor force. It's not going to be a magic uh, solution to lower productivity growth and all that stuff. But it can help, and uh, it may be worth doing. Again, the issue there is this is going to come with a bit more inflation. Uh, if, again, if expectations of inflation remain flat as they have, you know, it's, it's, it's less than 3% inflation on the realistic assumptions about the size of the deficit. So it's not an enormous amount, uh, and that may well be worth it. If this leads people to focus on inflation again and worry that fiscal deficits are going to continue and the Fed is going to be captured and expectations of inflation go up, there is a, a tail risk scenario that we should worry about. But I think it's, it's in the tail risk category at this point. Now, markets all over the world are moving. Um, in terms, if, if the U.S. were to have a big sort of fiscal stimulus and were to grow faster as a result, what might we expect the spillover effects to be uh, to other economies? Would it, be, would it lift them up as well? Would there be increased uh, demand for commodities and things of that nature? Would it be a good thing for the world, I think? Yes, I think on net, again, looking over the next few years, and uh, not worrying too much about things going wrong after. Uh, I think, yes, the next few years should be better for the world. I mean, higher growth in the U.S. is clearly good for exports from other countries. Uh, an appreciation of a dollar, which would probably come from the combination of fiscal expansion and uh, a tighter uh, uh, Fed, uh, is a depreciation of other currencies to, to the extent that you're floating vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. It's good. It would probably do good things to commodities. It might make the job of those countries which are not floating with respect to the dollar, which are pegging to the dollar a bit more difficult. But on net, I think it's a good thing. But that's the direct effect. Um, I think there are indirect effects, which may, uh, which may be of two sorts. One is economic. So uh, this shift from monetary to fiscal, I think is likely to reinforce the similar trend in European economies. There are many European economies which would like to do the same thing, but they were a bit reluctant hmm. if you, but because of Brussels rules and various other things. This is going, I think, to put a bit more pressure on them to actually do that. So I think we may see also more fiscal expansion uh, in, in a number of countries. And then the larger one is, is political, and uh, you know, you've read about it in the newspapers, which is that it clearly makes populism uh, more likely, more acceptable, more likely to succeed. You know, if I think about my own home country, uh, until Tuesday I put zero probability on the Marine Le Pen event, and now I, I have gone strictly positive. Uh, so I think these are the three dimensions I can think of. Well, so we can sort of think about how uh, faster American growth might boost uh, exports from other countries, might push up the dollar. Um, that may not lead to a very attractive situation for American exporters. Uh, Donald Trump has obviously come in promising to you know, make America great again, and uh, part of that means rejuvenating kind of manufacturing jobs and things like that. Um, is that going to be, I mean, obviously uh, Trump has talked about renegotiating trade deals and things of that nature, but are we also going to see pressure for new protectionism coming from this rise in the dollar? I think, ironically, so if we, if we move to trade, mm -hmm. I, I think that initially we're going to see mostly symbolic measures 
you know, asking for renegotiation of NAFTA, but nothing, nothing really bad. Uh, then maybe later on it, it becomes worse, or again, it, it starts a war that nobody wanted to actually have, but it starts it. But the macro implications of, uh, of, of the fiscal side imply that most likely trade deficits will increase. And then given that he was elected, on the idea of at least some of his advisors were obsessed with the trade deficits and he seems to have bought that, this is going to increase the pressure on protectionism. So one can think of an interaction between the macro and the trade, which leads to even more protectionism than, uh, than we're going to see at the beginning. That's uh, it's a worry. And I mean, given sort of slowing trade growth around the world, I mean, the odds of retaliation seem higher, I would, I would guess, than, than might, might have been the case a few years ago. Do you see that as, 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 as being the case? I don't know. I think it depends on each country. I was thinking this morning of what China could do if it put a tariff on, on some Chinese goods, either across the board or on, Chinese go on some Chinese goods. It seems to me that in a world in which you have these very complex global supply chains, many of them going through China, China can do very, very nasty things very quickly, hmm. uh, you know, just stop uh, the supply chain at one point and then the whole global thing uh, has a problem. So I think that in effect China has the tools to be rather unpleasant if Trump wants to be unpleasant. So the issue is, well, what happens? Do we get a full-fledged war, disruption of global supply chains, or the Trump administration understands fairly quickly that it is not in a strong bargaining position as it thought it was. Uh, but he's a great deal maker, though. Uh, yeah. um, so it, it, we've talked a bit today about the Fed. And a week ago, it seemed pretty clear what, well, I, I think it seemed clear what the Fed's likely moves were going to be over the next year or so. They're probably going to raise rates in December. And then uh, you know, maybe we could expect another rate increase or, or two next year. Um, one has to think that's changed a bit now. Uh, do, do you see the odds of, of, of multiple rate increases next year having gone up? Uh, what are they thinking uh, in the Eccles building right now? Well, I don't know that. Um, my sense is the Fed is going to try to act non-politically until the, appoint the reappointments of the appointments uh, of, uh, of, of the chair and the uh, vice chair. So I think they are going to increase interest rates. If fiscal seems to be coming online, then clearly they are going to increase interest rates a bit faster than they would otherwise. I don't think they are going to go to war uh, for various reasons. The, the fascinating issue is 2018, which is he, when he was candidate, you know, uh, accused Janet Yellen to be too dovish right, and be, help the Obama administration through low rates, and rates should be, you know, higher. When you become president, you change a bit your view of things, and you kind of like the central bank to go along with what you're trying to do. So I think if there's any rationality, he has to want a relatively dovish central bank. The issue is his advisors, uh, a strange group of people uh, with respect to monetary policy. I mean, they went from the, the gold standard people right. to the gold bugs to the Taylor wool and nothing else and so on and so on. But they are all hawks. I mean, I, I don't think there's any dove in the, in the bunch. So does he appoint one of them? And then the Fed becomes, you know, very reactive and jacks up rates. Or, or does he go for somebody else? So I think there's an enormous, in general, there's an enormous uncertainty coming from the, the heterogeneity, to be polite, the heterogeneity of advisors' views on various things. Right, so this is one, and I don't know who wins. It's the same thing on fiscal. Right. And his advisors, I suspect, are for fiscal expansion, but the Republic, many Republicans are adamantly against deficits and debt, right? So you have the supply siders who are perfectly happy to cut taxes and do dynamic scoring to show that it will not increase deficits. And then you have the people who don't want to do that. Who wins? I think a lot of the uncertainty comes from that. If I knew the measures, I could 
narrow the standard deviation bands quite a bit. Uh, but um, we don't know. So uh, stepping back and looking at all these, these different moving parts, you know, we have whatever the fiscal changes are in the U.S., whatever the changes to trade policy are, the Fed's reaction, whatever the, the spillovers or effects from, from abroad might be, which do you think over the next two to three years poses uh, the, the gravest threat to the American expansion? What should we worry most about? So again, I, I, any answer I give has standard deviation bands okay. associated with it. Take that as but my guess is that the fiscal will come first. And so I think that, you know, in terms of the focus of the, of the meeting, the probability of recession over the next two years is smaller. Uh, trade, unless something goes wrong unintentionally, will come into play more slowly. I mean, the adverse effects of, tra of, of trade restrictions will come in more slowly so that if we're talking three, four, five years down the line, then I start changing my, uh, my baseline from more growth to God knows. But I think the, the near future uh, looks high in terms of growth. Now, it doesn't look higher in terms of some of the things he has promised to deliver, which is I think all these measures are going to increase inequality rather than decrease it. So that two years down the line or even four years down the line, inequality or at least the, you know, the middle class position may actually be worse. I mean, if you think of all the measures, growth will be good, fairly good probably, but financial deregulation probably not. Uh, taxes, corporate taxes, income taxes on the rich, all this seems to go the wrong way. And, and even the, the uh, tariffs on imports, you know, will tend to affect uh, disproportionately the people at the bottom and the people at the top in terms of the effects on real income. So I think that's uh, more growth but more inequality. So f fairly quickly people may realize that they didn't quite Choose the right they, person. They getting. Now, uh, you know, he, uh, the, the Trump administration won't be the only sort of driving force in the world. There will be things they'll have to react to from abroad. Um, what are the, the biggest vulnerabilities that you see out there um, that might generate shocks to which uh, American policymakers will have to respond? So I, I think populism. Uh, and its implications is, can have fairly substantial economic effects and world systemic effects. Um, so within the so Eurozone, I, so instance, I think yeah, I'm thinking of the Eurozone. Uh, if I think about the countries in the South, they are having a very tough time. I don't think things are improving at all at the speed which is, uh, uh, which is acceptable. So populism will go up there. And as we know, it can come up in countries which are doing much better than that. Uh, France being, you know, an example. Even if Marine Le Pen doesn't win, she still has 35 percent of the of, of the votes potentially at this point. Uh, we saw it in England, where things haven't been so bad. So, but for the euro, I still think that the possibility that we have a major euro crisis is fairly high in which case this clearly has a number of systemic implications. Um, so that's one place. The other which worries me but has worried me for 15 years and uh, hasn't happened is a fiscal situation in Japan, mm. yeah, which is unsustainable. We all know it. The only people who don't seem to know it are the investors. Uh, at some stage, maybe we convince them and then we trigger something very unpleasant. I, they have a level of debt which is completely uh, unsustainable at positive interest rates or positive spreads. So these are the two places. For the rest of the world, more difficult. I mean, again, the countries are... I, I don't see an implosion in China, uh, which would, you know, is the other place where we look. I don't see an implosion in India, and the others are not systemic, I think. I mean, do you see the, uh, if, we, if we look at what hap has happened with, with bond yields uh, over the last few days, uh, the European periphery has been more affected than other places. Uh, emerging markets, some of which are quite vulnerable, have been more affected. Is, 
is it possible that, you know, before we even get to the policy making stage of the Trump administration, that these sort of market gyrations will, there will be, you know, create enough instability in, in, in global markets to, to materially affect the American recovery or the global economy in general? I don't know about the timing. I mean, if you're talking about the next, uh, the time until the, uh, you know, prompt actually becomes president. It's a very short time, so it's very difficult to predict. But uh, clearly a country, I mean, just to take an example, a country like Portugal is flirting yeah. with disaster. And investors may, some event may happen in Portugal in the next few weeks in which investors decide that, you know, they need a much larger spread uh, to, uh, to hold Portuguese bonds. Uh, Draghi is not in a position to just use QE because it's not supposed to deal with solvency issues but liquidity issues. So Portugal is in trouble. It has to have a program. It has to, um, uh, in order to benefit from more help. Um, this can escalate fairly quickly. Now, whether it's in the next month or the next year or the next three years, very hard to tell. But yeah, positive probability again. Are you surprised there isn't more f sort of fear across markets? I mean, uh, you know, it, there was the night of the election, e equity sort of acted like they were scared to death and then everything it's, kind of calmed down a bit. And, so I'm, I'm struggling with it. A very popular idea in economics as a result of a crisis is the importance of second moments, of uncertainty. Uh, and it's clear that it, you know, in 2009, this was clearly playing a role. But I think we should question, so there's clearly much more uncertainty about many things, right? The question is whether this affects consumer spending, investment spending or not. And I think there, I took a very strong stance when Brexit came. I, say, I, I said, well, I don't know what's going to happen in the long run, but in the short run, I'm sure of one thing, uncertainty is going to have a major effect in the short run uh, because of the option value of waiting. That basically, if you had, if you have to take a decision about where to locate a plant or where to develop a product, you'd, you don't know whether you want to do it in the UK or you want to do it on the continent, and it's not incredibly costly to wait a year or two. Therefore, I came out very strongly, big short run recession. I have not been very good at that. It, 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 <laughs> it hasn't come a yet. Made that mistake. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I, I keep hoping, obviously, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but so far, so even that type of uncertainty, where I think most economists would have said, "Well, that's really the type which is going to create, you know, a short run slump," didn't do it. And so I think the kind of uncertainty which doesn't have the option value aspect, which is going to last for a long time, may have even less of an effect. So I think we're all traumatized. We're all uncertain, uh, but whether it affects, again, activity or not, maybe, maybe not. I, I keep trying to think of what the right historical parallel is. And uh, to some extent, it's you know, the, the early 1980s. Uh, you had a politician come in and cut tax rates dramatically, uh, which led to a swelling of the current account deficit and some protectionist measures. Uh, on the other hand, it seems like if we're thinking about the possibility of kind of broad deglobalization, then you're thinking maybe we're more at the beginning of the 20th century, and, uh, and which um, had its, you know, had, had a somewhat darker um, uh, ending to it. I mean, do you have? How are you thinking about this, or is this, is that not the right way to, to sort of? No, I think walk through the clearly um, protectionism far beyond the elections last week. Um, protectionism is on the rise, mm -hmm. uh, very clearly. Some governments are going to be more protectionist. And, uh, so I think it, it is just not just a U.S. versus the world issue. It's a world issue, and it's quite possible to think that there are going to be more restrictions on trade. Um, that would be costly, obviously. And again, I want to go back to um, global supply chains. Uh, I want to take the, uh, the future of Africa. Uh, Africa has had fairly high growth over time. But it has come largely from an improvement in institutions, in governance, and in the high price of commodities at some point. But they still mostly have growth based on commodities. Not all, it's too general a statement, but they have to move to the next step if they want to continue to grow. How do they do this? 
They only do this by basically finding a spot in a global supply chain in which they can produce something and then move up. Uh, other, other, other ways of doing it haven't worked. Now, again, if uh, there's protectionism, global supply chains will be more limited. Um, if there is a risk of protectionism in a country, you know, no firm will want to basically have a crucial element of a production process in that country. So I think for a country like Africa, it wouldn't take a whole lot of protectionism in the world, uh, sorry, country, continent, uh, like Africa. Uh, it wouldn't take a whole lot of protectionism to, uh, to seriously affect their growth. So uh, yeah, I think we have to worry. Well, and I mean, the sort of ironic thing is that if you, if protectionism slows growth in places like Central America and Africa, you then may end up with much more uh, migration pressure uh, as a result of that, which would uh, obviously. Well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, migration, you know, whether your income is 10 times lower or seven times lower, you still want to go. That's true. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure about the elasticity, but yes. I mean, at the IMF, uh, you led sort of an, an interesting rethink about um, financial globalization and the right way to manage it. And um, do you, ex I mean, most of the focus so far on, on the possible unwinding of globalization is focused on trade. Is it possible that we'll actually see more happening to dampen capital flows, uh, particularly if you know, gyrations in the dollar start causing a lot of headaches? So on this, indeed, my views is that we should see more restrictions on, on I mean, I think, the capital account is that would be different desirable. from the current account. So I think trade is for the most part a good thing if it, if it comes with redistribution, but I don't have that view about capital flows. I think some of the capital flows are just plain bad uh, and reflects the, the worst aspects of herding in financial markets and uh, financial systems not being able to handle uh, these sharp variations. So my own preference is indeed to see uh, more capital management tools, as we call them, at, uh, at, at the fund. Uh, so I think that's desirable. Now, there is desirable and desirable, uh, and there are degrees. And clearly, it could, it's like fiscal deficits. I mean, I'm basically in favor of fiscal expansions, but I'm, I may see much more than I wanted, right? Uh, um, uh, and it may well be the same thing for capital controls which is that some governments take this as a license to do much more than I would like. I, we, I think people in my position, in my location on the left to right spectrum, may actually be very quickly in the position of saying, no, 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 don't do, don't do, don't do too much. Uh, that the things, you know, fiscal deficits, yes, but not too much. Capital controls, yes, but not too much. Uh, I can see myself being on the right side of the issue rather than the left side of the issue fairly quickly. I worry. Well, I, you know, on, on fiscal deficits and on debt loads in general, I mean, as you say, we've been expecting something nasty to happen in Japan for ages, and it never has. Um, there was a, a broad move to austerity after the crisis. Um, now, as you say, it seems like not just in the US, but in lots of countries, they may be moving the other direction. Do we, how quickly do we begin to you know, see ramifications from that, such as, you know, uh, troublingly high interest rates, or are we in a different world altogether and, and we are about to discover that actually deficits don't matter? Uh, I mean, where, how does that particular dynamic play out? I'll try to get it. I mean, the laws of economics are not going to be repealed. Uh, so I think some, some of the measures we think are bad will turn out to be bad. Uh, and, and we learn it, and some of the promises that have been made by populist governments will turn out not to work out. I worry again about the next phase there, which is when the people here or elsewhere conclude that the messiahs have not delivered, what happens next? Do they come back to reason, respect the elites, and so on? I'm not so sure. I think that they may look for something even crazier, like God knows. Uh, but I think they are going to be disappointed, so we have to think about what happens in, say, three, four years. Um, what are they look, going to be looking for? They are going to know that what they were promised this time probably didn't work. Um, 
So I think the answer to your question, I don't think it's going to work. I don't think uh, populism plus protectionism is going to work. For a while, it's going to lead to more growth, and it's going to be fine, but not uh, eventually not. Um, and then the question is, how do people react to that? Right. Well, I think now would be a good time to take some questions from our audience. Um, does anything, anyone have anything they'd like to ask? We clearly have answered. All We've that. answered every every question. So I, you know, I'm, I'll, I, thinking about the last sort of uh, two to three decades, and you know, apart from the sort of major global crisis, it was kind of an era of of moderation, long business cycles, um, when the central banks were mostly left to to run things. Is is that era gone? Is that at an end? Are we? Are, are is monetary policy going to be sort of? Uh, subsidiary now to, to governments who are taking control and responding to the need for faster growth? No, I, look, we don't exactly know why we had this period of, of, uh, of uh, great moderation. Uh, probably because we just happened not to have big shocks during that time. Uh, central banks would like to think it's because they did their jobs right, but I think that was proven wrong in 2008. I, so it was a combination of just luck in terms of uh, not having big shocks and having policies which were reasonable. Uh, I, we cannot assume that that's the case in the future. Uh, so it's clear that uh, monetary policy has to change and it cannot do the job. And that goes to the session that was before this one on fiscal. Uh, I think fiscal you know, has to become a macro tool again uh, in a major way. And uh, what amazes me, well, not the only thing, but something which amazes me is that's how little work there has been on fiscal as a macroeconomic tool uh, uh, since uh, 2008. Uh, you know, on automatic stabilizers, we've done nothing. Uh, and so, you know, if if this, if, this is a, if this had taken place uh, a week ago, I think we would have discussed, okay, so when the rest, next recession comes, uh, do we have the tools? And I would have argued that automatic stabilizers should play a much more important role. Um, it's, the issue is still there. Why is that? Why, are we, why did we fail to do that? I really do not know. Um, I enough. really do not know. If somebody, I mean, it's an interesting question because I think there are very, uh, very many low-hanging fruits. Um, you know, something which has fascinated me in my time at the Fund is at the IMF meetings, or the G20 meetings, or the G7 meetings, how all the ministers of finance were willing to accept the existing automatic stabilizers. So it was taken as you can allow them to work, but didn't want to discuss anything else, other stabilizers where we know that the automatic stabilizers were never designed to automatically stabilize. They were designed to make the income tax more progressive or protect the long-term unemployed. And they vary in strength enormously across countries. Right? So it makes absolutely no sense to say, well, you know, this and no more. I could not get any discussion going there. And there has been very little work in academia. Uh, I know of one paper. Um, by Ricardo Reyes. Uh, that's about it. And, and you can design, I mean, it's, it's so easy to design, you know, viable income taxes, viable investment tax credits. It, it can be done. It's just, it will probably come too late for the next recession. Yeah. That was a question there, right? Yeah. Uh, we actually started to address it just now. Um, You've each spoken kind of in broad terms about fiscal and monetary policy. I actually just wanted to ask, Olivier, what is your kind of preferred hierarchy of specific policies for targeting uh, inequality and for blunting um, the populist frustration uh, that's emerged all throughout the developed world? I think NIVA is well adapted. Um, you know, the, the, the the standard answer is uh, let the markets determine the pre-tax transfer distribution and then try to use the tax transfer system to uh, undo it. 
my sense is that given the size of the trends, inequality trends, this represents an enormous burden on the state in terms of the size of the transfers and so on. You know, I, I love the idea of an earning, earned income tax credit, but I did some computations, not for the US, but for France, as to what size it might have if the uh, uh, trends continue. It becomes very, very heavy on the state. So I think we have to think about things which can be done pre-tax transfer, namely in the initial market determined distribution. And that's tough. But I don't think monetary policy can do anything. Uh, and uh, I've, I've, I've said, I've mentioned the limits of fiscal. Um, you know, there's a sentence which is, it's not because a problem has no solution, that there's no problem. And it may well be that that's one of those. Uh, in many cases, I feel I have a solution to something. Uh, here, I'm not so sure that uh, there are politically realistic solutions to uh, dealing fully with inequality. We can clearly do something at the margin, but the trends are very strong. Um, I mean, to just go further, you know, there's a whole discussion about robots, uh, which seems a bit abstract, but I, I think it's something that we'll, have, we'll face in the next 10, 20 years. And therefore, even more formally, the issue of whether machines are complements or substitutes for workers. For 200 years, I think we've worried about machines being substitutes and technological unemployment, and never happened. But it could well happen. And this raises enormous issues of distribution, which is you can think of an economy with robots in which one person owns all the property rights to all the robots, and everybody else is unemployed. Uh, or you can think of an economy in which everybody has a French lifestyle, works one hour a day, uh, and owns robots, and everybody is equal. Uh, these are two extreme outcomes of technological development, um, and uh, we have to think very hard about uh, you know, how we react to this. Uh, if we wait for the market to do the outcome, and then we have to redistribute from the you know, one owner to everybody else, it's going to be very difficult. Um, should we try in the first place to have a distribution of property rights uh, so that everybody owns part of a robot? Uh, uh, managed in such a way that the distributional outcomes are acceptable. But I'm very pessimistic because it seems to me we're dealing with very, very strong trends. And the ability of the state to undo them uh, exposed, I think, is limited. I hope I'm wrong. I think we have time for one more quick question. We'll go here. It seems to me that uh, the optimism uh, in the market or you know, your assessment I, I so far. You. So it seems like the optimism, say, in the market, uh, in the equity market, or what you've been talking about so far, based uh, largely on the assumption that the fiscal expansion is going to be sizable, uh, which, you know, uh, as someone who works on Capitol Hill, I would um, really have reservation. Uh, on, in that assumption. So, um, you know, uh, and you add that to the uncertainty that uh, the election outcome has introduced to uh, the private sector. Um, do you think uh, it's, uh, the, the Fed should think about uh, tightening, uh, the, the delaying the tightening of uh, monetary policy in, in the near future? So the question is where the markets are right or not, in a way, if, uh, if, and we're, if, we're given all these things. So, I mean, I, again, two separate reasons why the markets have reasons to be optimistic. The first one is the fiscal, if it happens. But again, we know in Congress, some people really don't want it to happen, so we don't know what size it will have. But even if there was not that, it's clear that uh, the tax reforms are good for firms, I mean, corporate tax repatriation of uh, earnings from abroad with amnesty. All this is very good. So I, I would expect you know, the stock market to do well based on that. Now, do they, they should also take into account uncertainty. But surprisingly, the VIX hasn't done what I thought it might do. So I think they might well be too optimistic about the uncertainty. And then again, yes, uh, do they take enough into account the possibility that the Fed is going to increase interest rates a lot? I think on this, they're probably realistic that the Fed is not going to increase interest rates very much, just as needed. 
Uh, but again, there is a risk that they do more. Uh, are the markets right or wrong? Sometimes I feel they're wrong. And sometimes I'm wrong about thinking that they're wrong. Uh, but uh, in this case, no, I think it's kind of reasonable. Um, on net, I think, again, we'll see growth. We'll see a shift in the share of going to capital. Uh, we'll see high interest rates, but not that much higher. And so for the next few years, if you don't look beyond that, uh, probably OK. I mean, the question is, again, this is a populist government. I think we can call it this way. And if we look at Latin America, populist experiments always end up bad. The question is, can we take the lesson from there and then say, well, it's going to happen in the US? I'm not so sure we don't start from the same place. The notion of a sudden stop against the dollar is not terribly, uh, like, you know, it's, it's implausible. So it may end better uh, than it did in, in Latin America. There is a risk, but it's probably further out, and the stock market doesn't look that far. Olivier, thank you very much for sharing you your well. thoughts. Thank you all for, for listening and uh, for coming today. And uh, I believe that's the... the uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to make a few closing remarks. I'm just, just stay here for just a second. Sure. It won't be long, and you'll be more comfortable. Um, so, so first of all, I want to thank everyone for your attention and for being with us here today. Um, so I wrote a few notes up. Um, this has been a, uh, there, there may not be an order, and I may not be able to read, but this has been a very, um, we knew when we set out this conference that it was a somber topic. But I don't think that I had quite processed just how somber the mood would be here today on almost all the panels. And this frustration that, you know, in some sense, that you could hear in all of the conversations, this one included, that having a recession may not be the worst thing for an economy. Sometimes a recovery that isn't really a recovery that works for all, that leads to massive uh, popular frustration, actually is going to lead to economic policies that it seems to be the consensus, at least on these panels, may actually lead to even worse economic outcomes uh, down the long run, even if it is not actually a so-called recession. That seems a very sobering um, lesson that I'm taking from today and um, is not the pick-me-up that I was kind of hoping a conference on the next recession might be. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying for humor here. It's not going to work. Um, so, but I do think it's important um, I think there's a few lessons from today. And one is that I think it's important for those who think about economic policy to remember that a recession is not necessarily the worst economic outcome, but a long, um, too slow, too tepid, um, uh, too weak economic recovery that doesn't actually improve living standards um, in the way that we would want it to um, is also something that people feel the pain of out there um, uh, around the country. And I think that's something that we should be thinking about in our research agendas and our policy prescriptions. Uh, we've learned a lot today about a number of questions that many of the folks here on the panels had today. Um, a few of them that really stuck with me, although there were tons of good ones. Um, so one was this ongoing question about how we shore up automatic stabilizers for the next team that came up on this panel, that came up on the first panel, on the second, and the third. So this is certainly something that I think there's a lot of appetite um, for researchers to know more about in order to inform policymaking. Um, questions about how uh, microeconomic trends affect ma macroeconomic outcomes. That came up in a number of places at equitable growth where we're really interested in the mechanisms through which inequality can affect the economy. That's certainly something that we are um, characterologically interested in as well. Um, and then, you know, a, a number of panels um, today called for more research, and we heard it here on this one as well, more research on um, uh, fiscal policy as a tool. What does that mean? How can we learn more about it? Um, how can we know more about this? Um, and we've learned, uh, and we knew, but we've heard talked about today, how our economic models, um, we know that they both failed to predict the Great Recession, but they also failed to predict the weakness of the recovery. And um, I want to give just, you know, Claudia on her panel made a comment that I thought was really important, or actually might have been in the conversation we had right after her panel, that, um, that models are how uh, the next generation of econ policy, young econ policymakers actually um, understand how the world works in some ways. So the extent to which our models don't work, if they don't have folks around there to tell them that they don't work, 
and they still aren't working, that doesn't actually help them give good policy advice. And I thought that was a really astute point for the importance of getting those models right, or at least understanding where they, um, what the what we all agree are the the failures. Um, and I'm going to end on a bit of a a, a self-reflective note, which is that. Um, Jared uh, Bernstein, at the end of his panel, um, got a little agitated, um, a little frustrated about the idea that, um, that, that facts are on the run, as he said in his usual quippy way. Um, that, that there is this sense, I think, that this election has shown that um, for those of us who think about facts and evidence, um, either we were not able to articulate the depth of knowledge that we have about what to do about an economy that's failing people, or people don't believe us, or maybe we're just wrong. But all of this points to, um, I think, a deep uh, concern about to what extent the research that we're all going to continue to do will matter in the political space. And so that uh, that's something that I think we're going to be thinking a lot about equitable growth. It's a conversation that I hope we can have with our friends in the media to help us figure out how we communicate better, um, but also just some soul searching on, on how we think about the um, what science can tell us about, and I just called economics a science, so there you go, but what science can tell us about uh, how we can make um, good economic policy and how we can do better at communicating that. So with that call to action, hopefully, um, I want to thank you again all for coming. A, a round of applause for our last panel here today, and um, thank you.